Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of 2 Samuel, and yesterday we left it off at verse 22. Today we continue with verse 23, and by way of review, uh, I just want to highlight a couple of things that we should pay attention by the time we get to verse 23, uh, so that we, we bear these things in mind. The, 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 the beginning and end of chapter 14's key message is in verse 1 and verse 22. Uh, and, and by way of review, let me just scroll up and I shall show you what I mean. In verse 1, we read of um, Yoav. Yoav actually uh, notes, he, he, he perceived, he discerns, right? He discerns, he finds out that the king's heart was longing for Afshalom. Now, this is uh, the question that we, we may want to ask is why, why did Yoav do all he did between verses 1 and 22. And the reason is because of Joab's concern for the king. The king, King David, is pining for Avshalom. And it affects his demeanor, it affects his uh, focus, it affects his entire life as a king when he has a part of his mind uh, not entirely in the rule of the country uh, but in, in a large part focusing on his son who has been banished from Israel and he is now in Geshur uh, somewhere in Syria and he will not be back at all. And so Yoav then hatches this entire uh, narrative that we read from verses 2 all the way down to verse, I guess, uh, 20, right? And, and, and by then, you find that you can see Yoav is really trying to help King David come to terms with allowing Avshalom to come back and uh, using the wise old woman to tell the story, uh, to let the king know that even God has mercy on those uh, that he allows to run to the, uh, the, the cities of refuge, that, that they are not going to be killed, right? They're going to be spared and they can come back one day. How is it that King David has banished Afshalom and, uh, and, and is never wanting him to, uh, allowing him to come back, and yet his heart is pining for the son. And that was what Yoav was trying to do, to convince the king that it's okay to let Afshalom come home. And so yesterday when we looked at verse 21, uh, the king says to Yoav, Go and do this. Bring back the young man of Shalom. So it was an instruction to go and do it. And note 22 when we ended, Yoav fell on his face or to the ground, prostrated himself, blessed the king and says, Today your servant knows that I found favor in your sight. Why did, did Yoav say that? It's because the king uh, listened to his advice. Otherwise, why would a king listen to him? That, that's the principle here. That my lord, the king, in that the king has performed the request of his servant and to listen to Yoav and allow Afshalom to come back. So that is the background as we begin. Verse 23 shows us this. After uh, whatever took place in verse 22, you find that this first word, as we always note, the word so here is and then, after that, Yoav 
arose. Why? He was prostrated down on the floor. Uh, and then, so we see this, another and then. He went to Geshur. That would be in Syria. Then, and then he, well, this word uh, brought uh, basically is he, he, he caused to come or to come back. And that's why the translator used the word brought. Uh, not that it's wrong. I'm just showing you that there is a, a it's a little bit more in the Hebrew that that Yoav caused Avshalom to come back to Jerusalem. Cause means to convince him, to tell him the instructions from the king, uh, to inform him, and to bring him back, uh, join him in the entourage, and make sure he comes back to Jerusalem. That's the idea of brought, right? Although the English word is a more simplified idea, uh, the word really means very causative, that Yoav literally went to talk to Avshalom and convince him to join him to come home. That's that's all it it's in all in the in the Hebrew. Verse 24. However, and this is and then, and the translators use however meaning there was something contrary to uh to add on to the instructions. This is and then the king said when Avshalom returns he needs to uh he he needs to go back to his own house right that that would be the idea so he needs to turn this word is uh turn towards right turn towards or turn around how would that be is uh, Avshalom comes back to Jerusalem and then he goes to his house and not to David. That's what it means. He is not to see David, right? He is not to see David. And so he goes all the way back to his house. This is what it means by return. This is not shuv as in repentance. This is about turning around kind of uh, idea to his house. And he shall not see my face. This is in recognition that now Avshalom has come back, but there is no reconciliation in its entirety because David is still saying that it, it's, it's not enough, but he's back. So Avshalom turned to his own house and did not see the king's face. Now understand this, the king's face means there is favor, right? That, that the king would be, uh, would be, would, would, feel well or treat him well would accept him but not at this point in time when the king says you can't see my face you cannot approach me there is some barrier that is still there between David and Avshalom verse 25 verse 25 says this the word noun is and and is telling us a piece of information. Now, uh, the Hebrew says this, now, uh, well, it's, it's just a slight difference in, in arranging the word, but it, it's still the same uh, translation. The, the Hebrew says that, now, like Avshalom, there 
was not a man in all Israel as beautiful or as handsome. Right? Basically, it's saying that Avshalom is extremely handsome or extremely beautiful. Now, in the English, we do not use the word beautiful uh, for a man, but it actually does mean beautiful. It means fair, right? It means handsome, right? As, as in a man. Uh, it is he's comely. Uh, he, he is, how should we say? Um, he is very attractive to the eyes, maybe you want to say that, right? He is outstanding, outstanding to the eyes. Now, this verse 25 is a background piece of information about Avshalom. And that he is so outstanding that there was no one like him, no one comparable to Avshalom in all Israel, in the land from Dan to Beersheba, right? Beersheba. Meaning from north to south, there's no one in the land that is as beautiful, as handsome, as outstanding to the eyes as he was. And then it says here that he is so highly praised uh, is a reference to his beauty. And so this is very rare to say it for a man, right? David was like that too. Uh, and now this Avshalom, his own son. Uh, I guess you can say tall, dark, and handsome kind of gentleman, right? And the description here is from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. There was no blemish. This impairment is blemish. He is so perfect in, in the appearance, right? From the sole of his feet, means the palm of his foot, to the top of his head would mean his scalp. From top to toe, we would say today. So from top to toe. The Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew would say from the palm of his foot to the scalp. There was no blemish in him. It means that he is so perfect as a human being uh, it, with regards to his external appearance. And, and the, this verse here is to highlight the, the next coming passages of how he would be very attracted. Uh, so remember, when Saul was elected as king, he was like that too. He was outstanding. Uh, David was another. Uh, and, and Avshalom is another. And, and that becomes a, seemingly a characteristic of the kings of Israel. And in his mind, in Avshalom's mind, I think this is being hatched. In verse 26, it says, when he cut the hair of his head, now cut the hair of his head, uh, I guess may not be so accurate, right? This is in the intensive form. I think the better way, what is when he shaved his head, bald. Right? He shaved bald. At every year's end, uh, because it was too heavy, right? It was very heavy on him, and he would cut it or shave it, meaning take it all off. He weighs the hair at 200 shekels. 200 shekels uh, by the king's weight. Now, what does that mean? Uh, literally, uh, it would be 200 shekels uh, equivalent to, I don't know, uh, 
one over three thousand of a talent. Let me see whether I can get you some numbers. It's it's a measure of uh, a weight. Uh, the word weight here literally means uh, a stone, right? The king's stone. And this is usually uh, for taxation purposes, and that everybody has a a, a a standard of weight, and usually for money, right? Usually for money, and it's called a shekel. And this would be two hundred shekels of the king's measurement of money. That would be a lot, I would say, uh, because hair is very light and 200 shekels would be uh, a lot of hair. So he, he grows hair very, very quickly. Now verse 27. Verse 27 here says, and then. What we know is these children would be born after he comes back to Jerusalem, not when he was in Geshur. So it says, and to Avshalom, there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar, the name of his sister. Again, you read here, she was a woman who is beautiful in appearance. And that is correct. Beautiful to the sight. So we find that uh, Tamar, the sister of uh, Avshalom, Avshalom himself, and Tamar, the daughter, this is the daughter, this is the sister, they are all very beautiful to the eyes. That's basically what the text is telling us. There is a, a peculiar characteristic of this uh, household uh, being the, the son of David. In verse 28, it says, Avshalom lived two full years in Jerusalem. Uh, the, the idea of two full years is found in these words. This would be uh, Shunatayim. Shunatayim would be uh, the word year in a dual form, meaning two years. Uh, and then it says of days. And typically this is an expression that uh, we're not just only talking about Years, we're also talking about the weighing of days. So two years of days would be how we read. So two years of days is two full years. In Jerusalem, and he did not see the king's face. That's the background story that we have. Every time you see the word and without the then, is a piece of information, right? It's a piece of information, that's all. Now comes the narrative to continue. The narrative was this, and then, and then Avshalom sent for Yoav. Now the word sent for Yoav is to go and send Yoav to come and see Avshalom. Avshalom sent for Yoav for the purpose to send him to the king. So this would be the charge, the delegation of authority. And this would be the action is to go to the king. But he would not come to him. Now, this is interesting because in the, in the Hebrew, we read this. Uh, the, word, the word he would not come to him literally means and 
uh, he was not willing, right? Not willing to come. Uh, not consenting to do it. Not yielding to the, the, the instructions of Afshalom. Uh, what else can you say about this? Um, you can say that, um, that he did not desire you can see all of these are variations of or nuances of the word itself that he did not want to come to him. So we have Yoav and to him would be Avshalom. Yoav did not want to come to Avshalom who was not willing to do it. He not consenting, he is not yielding to this request. He does not desire to do it at all. Now, this word here, so, would be, and then, he sent word again a second time, and he would not come. It bears the same instance of the meaning. He's not willing to come. He's not consenting to come. He's not yielding to come. Uh, he's not desiring to come. Yes, he would not come. So he would not come is the gist of the idea. Uh, just showing you how the Hebrew would convey a, and, it, and a meaning that is quite all-encompassing to understand the, the nature of the mind of Yoav. Verse 30, Avshalom begins to hatch a plan. Therefore, this word here means and then. Therefore is a style of writing in English. So, and then your, uh, Avshalom said to his servants, see, your house plot. This word here is plot of land. Right? Plot of land is next to mine. Next to mine literally means uh, how should you say um, is to my hand. That would be the idea. So if you were to look to your right hand, say for example, uh, your arm spot is just next to my hand. You know, that, that would be the idea here. And so next to mine. Right next to mine. Now, it, that's the English. Then that's the English. And then it says, he has barley there in that part of plot of the land. And so he says, go and set it on fire. Go burn it. Why? Because when you burn it, then your Alf will set up and notice that something is happening and then he will come and see me. And so, the word so here is, and then the servants listen to Yoav and set the plot on fire. Now you notice this is the second time um, in the last two chapters that Avshalom is able to convince people to do things for him. All right. Now we come to verse 31. In verse 31, this is, and then Yoav got up. So he must be seated down or lying down. Uh, and then the word here is, and then after he stood up, he came to Avshalom at the house. This is Avshalom's house. So you have Yoav going to Avshalom's house. And then, and then after he, when he gets to the house, he says this, Why have your servants set my plot on fire, my plot of land on fire? Verse 32. Now we say, 
there is another one that's missing and then understand that this is a narrative that goes on from uh, verse to verse. You know, we have this, it goes to this and then it says this and then now it says this. That is what it means. It's now going in a sequence so that you can actually imagine how the conversation is happening. Uh, you don't find that in the English text very much, mainly because that's not a, not a good English style, but it is a very good Hebrew style. And then Avshalom answered Yoav. What do you mean, why did my servants burn? He says, look, I sent for you. I told you to come here so that I may send you to the king. You come here, I'll talk to you, and I'll send you to the king. And then he says, why have I come from Geshur? I want to know why am I here. It would be better for me still to be there. That was the, the, the issue. Why bring me back? Leave me there. right? Leave me there because it's easier for me to, uh, well, I guess you say out of sight. Out of mind, right? And so Avshalom says, if I'm over there, you sure? I don't think of David anymore. And so now his argument is this. And now then, let me see the king's face because if I come back and I don't see the king's face, I feel this guilt in my, my heart all the time. I want to see the king's face and literally see with his eyes the king's face, meaning you can do this face to face. Right? This is the king. You want to see him face to face. If that's the case, then he would be more uh, consoled. It says, if there is guilt in me, if there exists an avon, if he is still so bent to blame me, then he can have me die. Right? This word here literally means cause to die. He can do something to either execute me uh, or kill me in some way, get somebody to kill me. But the idea here is Avshalom says, well, if I'm really wrong, then, then just do it, right? Just do it. So verse 33 is our last verse for this chapter. This word so means and then. After Avshalom spoke to Yoav and said all these things, then Yoav went to the king. Right? And then, after he goes to the king, he reported these things. After Yoav reported these things, um, then you find that he went to call, right? He went to call, and this would be an and then here, because it has to be after Yoav reported, right? This reported and told him everything. And then David, this would be David here. He summoned Avshalom. The word summon is to call. Call for Avshalom. This word then is and then. After being called, Avshalom then came to the king. And when he sees the king, and then he prostrated himself. Means all the way down. It's not bow down. It is really all the way down to the ground. And uh, this is described with his face to the ground before the king. Uh, literally with his nose to the ground. 
not just face to the ground, but nose to the ground. Uh, and the ground here would be the soil, the adama, to the face of the king. Our final words are these. And this would be, and then the king kissed Shalom. Now understand this. This is a very important ancient gesture. This means David accepts of Shalom back. That's all it means. It means that it is showing affection, and by showing affection, the Hebrew culture is to kiss the person. Uh, and, and by doing that is an acceptance to receive him back into the house. That's how we would understand verse 33. So, Yoav completed his task. Uh, when it was the king who had decided that it was about time, uh, when it was instigated by Absalom, after two years, two whole years of doing nothing but sit at home and cannot see the king, even though he was the king's son. Now, I'm not sure how intensive the reaction would be, but it, it stimulated uh, Absalom to burn Yoav's barley plot just to gain his attention. And so when that happened, it triggered the sequence of events that led to David kissing of Shalom. Now, the twist of the plot comes from the following chapters. As a consequence of chapter 11 and then chapter 12, the thing that he did with Bathsheba, with Uriah, uh, the, the story that um, uh, Nathan the prophet told him and how God uh, describes to him that what is going to happen to his family is about to be played out before his eyes. And with this, we come to the end of our chapter today.